sure some of the real stuff starts. So I want to talk about the uh, construction of the scholar representation. So outline the general strategy. Uh, And so before starting, let me probably give a precise statement of the theorem because it hasn't appeared so far in the lectures. So again, I fix my totally real OCM field and any integer at least one. Um, and I fix, well, I'm now really working in the idealic setup. So I'm work taking in the finite adults of this number field, a compact open subgroup. <clears throat> and then I have some locally symmetric space, called this XK. Well, on the left you divide by um, the rational points of this group, and then you have this uh, symmetric space for the real points, where you divide by some maximal compact subgroup and the positive reals. And take this part away from P. So where K infinity is maximal compact. So in the case considered so far, this quotient was either hyperbolic two or hyperbolic three space. And uh, we didn't really see this factor because uh, uh, we were considering a situation where this compact open subgroup is so large that if I take the quotient by G of F, it acts transitively on this set. And so we just divide this arithmetic, this uh, symmetric space by some arithmetic subgroup. Um, okay, and then uh, we have all the hack operators acting on that and the theorem is falling. Uh, for any Hecker eigenvalue system alpha so, so a set of alpha p's where p runs to the prime ideals of this field f um, appearing in So far, I've considered homology, so let me continue doing this. Creating the homology of this guy for any fixed prime number p, um, there exists a Galois representation. Rho alpha of the absolute Galois group of f going to GLN fp bar. Uh, such that for all unramified primes, in a suitable sense, it's, a, it's an explicit finite set of so-called ramified primes that I have to exclude. It's explicit. Uh, uh, the characteristic polynomial of rho alpha of the Frobenius element at p uh, is given in terms of like operators. And it's a formula we expect. Uh, so in particular, the trace uh, will be, uh, I mean, the trace and all the other ones will be eigenways of one of these hack operators. Okay, so that's the theorem. And uh, today, I want to restrict for simplicity, but it also doesn't make a dif big difference, uh, restrict to the case that this field is just rational numbers. Okay. And so let me begin by recalling what was known about the existence of color representations. <clears throat> and for this, uh, one has to go into the setting of Shimura varieties again. 
So such as this modular space of elliptic curves, the modular curves that appeared earlier. So uh, I should also say that I might slip and write sometimes g, and g, if I write it, is supposed to be the same as n. Um, so let a n uh, be the Siegel modular space. of genus n. So, and uh, I will not actually, so some, I should include a level in the notation, but I will ignore that. So it's a quotient of some symmetric space again by some gamma. And again, I'm ignoring the idyllic part. Um, so where gamma in sp2nz, some congruent subgroup. And Sn is a Siegel space, so uh, comes equipped with an action of the symplectic group. Um, so it's a set of those n by n matrix com complex n by n matrices, uh, which are symmetric and whose imaginary part is positive definite. So, if I specialize this to the case n equals 1, which maybe in view of the theorem is not the most interesting case, but uh, anyway, so a1 is just a modular curve I introduced earlier. Um, and so all of these, contrary to these locally symmetric spaces for GLN, these guys for the symplectic groups, they behave uh, just like the modular curve. So all these an are algebraic and defined over, well, maybe a finite extension. And so the, the algebraic meaning is that they are a modular space uh, of principally polarized. Be in varieties. Okay. And so uh, the following theorem was known. Although I'm not sure whether it was stated in this form in the literature, but uh, so I will say whom the theorem is due to in a second. Um, so, I take a cuspidal Hecke eigenform of regular weight in some sense, uh, so if you're in the case of the modular curves, and this is supposed to be weight at least two, I would think that you can remove this assumption of regular weight just by periodic interpolation, but um, let's stick to this case. Uh, because it's enough for the applications uh, on this uh, Siegel space, um, then there is a, an attached scalar representation. So for any, so this is a priori some guy with complex coefficients, um, but because of the algebraic nature of this modular space, all the Hecke eigenvalues will actually be algebraic numbers. and I want to consider them as periodic numbers, so I simply fix an isomorphism between uh, QP bar and uh, C. Uh, so there exists some representation, our representation rho of phi of the absolute gamma group. And if you think in terms of this, uh, Langlands duality, so you have an automorphic form of a symplectic group. The so dual group of the symplectic group is an odd orthogonal group. Um, and for the moment, I only claim that you get the composite Gaur representation where you embed this orthogonal group into GLN plus one, GL2 n plus one. Uh, and so this guy is self-dual. And you would expect it uh, 
to factors who are an orthogonal group, and maybe this is known, um, but I didn't. So there, there are some statements about whether this color representation is orthogonal or symplectic. Um, so it might be known that this is actually factoring through an orthogonal group. So there exists a color representation associated with F. Well, in the same sense that if you look at characteristic polynomials of Fibinius elements, then those are expressed through Hecke operators. Well, it means that the transfer to GLN is still cohomological. I guess it, it's cool to saying it's cohomological for the group itself. So. The Hodge state, state, state rates are distinct. That's, that's, yeah. The Hodge state rates of this color representation are supposed to be distinct. And you can easily read them off from uh, some of the weight of this. I mean, that's yeah, yes. But, I mean, is it true that whenever you have a discrete series on the symplectic group and you transfer it to GL? N, the endoscopic transfer to GLN plus 2N plus 1, but it's still discrete series? GLN does not have discrete series, so... Ah, oh, sorry, uh, what do I want to say? Well, the condition is that if you compute what sort of state rates of this color representation are supposed to be, that those are distinct. That's the regularity assumption. <laughs> Uh, so, why is the theorem known? So, there are two big ingredients. The first is the work of Arthur, which relies on the fundamental lemma of Ngo and the stabilization of the twisted trace formula, which I think was just finished by Walz Berger. Um, and so, taking their work, and probably I forget a lot of names, which also entered into this story, uh, you know that there is an endoscopic transfer uh, from uh, automorphic representations. Uh, I mean, I should probably say discrete automorphic representations of the symplectic group uh, to self-dual. Automorphic representations of GL2 plus 1. <coughs> so, in general, if I start with some F, the outcome will not be cuspidal anymore, but um, you can somehow decompose it and uh, reduce to the cuspidal case here. Um, and then uh, there is other work uh, that for self-dual guys, you know how to attach color representation. So that's work which probably started with Clausel and Kotwitz. Also relying on some transfer result back to unitary groups of Labesse, and then Harris Taylor used this. And then there were some remaining cases where, that were essential, that were finally uh, all settled. Um, so you know how to attach to such self-dual guys uh, some Galois representations. So. Uh, Ah, I should remark that, so, where do we find this color representation? Again, we find them in the geometry, like in the modular curve case. But now, uh, so one finds these color representations. Except in very few cases, so usually, in the cohomology of some u1 to n. Oh, she more variety. So what you do is you take the self to automorphic representation of GL2 n plus 1, uh, base change it to some imaginary quadratic field, and then descend uh, to some unitary group. 
And then you look at the Shimura variety for this unitary group, and then in this Shimura variety, you will actually find the correct dollar representation. Except that you will maybe only find the restriction to this imaginary quadratic field, but then if you do it for enough imaginary quadratic fields, uh, you get this color representation of the Q. Okay, so this was known. <clears throat> and uh, so we want to use these color representations. So we want to reduce to the to some cuspidal Hecker eigenforms on the Siegel space. But we are on this group GLN. So first of all, we have to move from uh, GLN to the symplectic group. And that's done using the Borussia compactification. And this idea is probably due to uh, Clausel. That one can uh, try to understand this locally symmetric space for GLN by embedding it as a boundary component of the Borel cell compactification. So that's a compactification of this guy AN into AN Borel cell, so inclusion J. So recall that this guy was actually some algebraic variety. However, this guy will just be a real manifold with corners. Um, but it has a very convenient property uh, that this inclusion J is in homotopy equivalence. And so what do the boundary strata look like? The strata A N N X P or else there. Boundary strata uh, of the Borel's air computation. They are parameterized by rational parabolic subgroups. Of the symplectic group. And what do the strata look like? So the stratum AMPBS will be a torus bundle over the locally symmetric space uh, for the Levy M. So although this is some algebraic variety, this is non-algebraic, and so in its boundary, these real manifolds will appear. <coughs> and so we are interested in a specific parabolic. Maybe we consider uh, P, which is this block upper triangular guy. Oh. Um. But these blocks are size n times n. Uh, so that's the so-called Siegel parabolic. And it's Levy. M is just the group we're interested in. So because this is supposed to be an element in the symplectic group, some of the lower stars say, uh, transpose inverse of the upper star, and so you just have one free n by n matrix. And so I don't want to go through all the details in this uh, analysis, but it implies that uh, 
the torsion homology of uh, the locally symmetric space for GLN. Uh, contributes <coughs> to the homology for this uh, Siegel space. So what we've succeeded to do so far is that we've at least transferred our torsion class to some algebraic variety. And so, as an algebraic geometer, you feel you're in a slightly better situation. Well, it's some kind of induced representation somehow. So the Hecker eigenvalues behave like the one where you would induce from uh, the GLN to the symplectic group. So you can, I mean, this picture is somehow the spore cell compactification is Hecker covariant, and you can. You can analyze what the Hecker eigenvalues are here. Um, but it's still, a to it's still potentially a torsion class on this uh, Shimura variety. <coughs> and also, what we did is somehow we embedded it in, in the boundary. So you think it's some kind of Eisenstein series. Uh, but we only know something for cusp forms. So if you want to succeed, then also we somehow have to find congruences between Eisenstein series and cusp forms in some sense. And, but there's the following theorem that does this for you. Um, Uh, for any system of Hecker eigenvalues, uh, this again causes alpha, uh, appearing in this torsion homology, there exists a cus cuspital Hecker eigenform. which you can make of regular weight. Uh, such that the Hecker eigenvalues of F are congruent to alpha mod P. So, so this means that on a Shimura variety, any torsion class actually, in some sense, lifts to characteristic zero. Um, it may not be that it somehow literally lifts inside this homology group to a class with ZP bar coefficients. Um, but somewhere you can find a cuspidal Hecker eigenform which lifts these Hecker eigenvalues. And on the other hand, you can always make it cuspidal. So even although uh, so even if you start with a class in here, which lifts to characteristic zero, it's not clear that you can find this cusp form because this might somehow be coming from some kind of Eisenstein series, and you have to find this congruence to a cusp form. So yes, so I should say this. So F may have, uh, yeah, let's call this deeper level at P. You can keep the level away from P fixed, but you may have to increase the level at P to get this form. No, no, of regular weight, so it's cohomological. So it's, 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 it falls into the realm of the theorem. And in fact, that's an extremely general theorem, so this works for any Shimura variety of Hodge type.
I think it's much deeper. Um, I think in the delian cell lemma, what the situation is that you have only cohomology in, cohomology in one degree. And so if you only have cohomology in one degree, then it's flat and you can always live to characteristic zero for stupid reasons. But that's certainly not the case here. And you could replace, uh, with a slightly more careful formulation, you could replace fp bar by z mod p to the n, yes. No, no, no. No, it lives in it's just a global section of some usual automorphic vector bundle. It's usual, some uh, coherent guy, a holomorphic form. It's, it doesn't live in the homology. So that's somehow in some H0 of this AN. Actually, you can just take a tensor power of this usual ample line bundle omega. And then you look at the cuspel part in there. And the congruence is only a congruence of Hecker eigenvalues. Yeah, but he con he conjectures that you don't have to increase the level at p, but he. So he conjectures that in some cases you don't have to increase the level precisely when some uh, L function is divisible by P at some point, right? Um, so it's some kind of analog of this, but I don't assume a vanishing of some L value mod P, but instead I may allow myself to increase the level at P. I think if you, com if you do the computation, you might see that this actually forces this L value to vanish mod P's, the analog. And so because this works for any Shimura variety of Hodge type, you actually can show that uh, whenever you have any torsion class on the Shimura variety, um, then it will always have an attached Galois representation. Because variants of the theorem are now known in wide generality for Shimura varieties. Okay, so that's the key theorem, and let me first explain how one deduces uh, the result, which is now not so hard. Um, or maybe I go to the right back. Oops, oops, here we are. Hmm, which paper? Well, this theorem is. This theorem is used to get my Galois representations, yes. So that's because what, what was known, I mean, for my work. So, so now the diagram is the following. So we start with the torsion homology class. Uh, uh, for the general linear group. Then, by embedding this as this boundary component, we go to the torsion homology uh, of the symplectic group, or some of the Siegel moduli space equivalently. Um, then we do this lifting. So we get a cost form. Uh, on the Siegel modular space. Then we use uh, that theorem there on the existence of color representation, so we can go to some color representation row, which goes to GL 2n plus 1 QP bar. Then we can reduce mod P. And then we get some row bar. Uh, which goes to GL2n plus 1 of fp bar. 
uh, but recall that we actually wanted the Galois representation to GLN. Um, what happened here is that uh, we were essentially taking some kind of induction, some parabolic induction, and this means that this should be some of the direct sum of the representation in this dual. And so uh, the final step is to show that uh, this rho bar actually decomposes into a sum of rho zero uh, plus rho zero dual plus trivial representation, where rho zero is a sort of representation. <clears throat> but that's not so hard. So. Uh. so what you do is you apply this to many twists of this original Ecker uh, uh, eigenvalue class, and then you get some more. Uh, what you get is some more uh, zero tensor chi, rho zero dual tensor chi inverse, and the trivial representation. And all this twist allows you to isolate one of these factors. And so the crucial theorem is really this uh, lifting theorem here. Yeah, yeah, one has to prove that rho bar has this form. But, oh. It's rather, rather elementary. So, so exercise in finite groups. I should say it took me a few weeks to do it, but <laughs> yeah. Um, is the first error somewhat canonical? Or? The first error is canonical, the second one, of course, not. All the straight arrows are canonical. But the lifting, of course, is some choice. So. I mean, uh, by cusp form, you really mean uh, cusp eigenform. Cusp eigenform. Cusp eigenform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you should add eigen everywhere. Well, I mean, you have a map from the cohomology of the boundary, which goes to the cohomology of the whole space. And so if you have a class there, then it goes to something. It might go to zero, but then by Poincaré duality, someone has to appear somewhere else. And, uh, I think it's essentially canonical, yes. But you don't need eigenform to make it canonical. <coughs> you don't need that it's an eigenform. Yes, yes, so, yes. So, I, don't, I, I, I always thought it's attributed to Closel and Harris that um, you cannot find these color representations that you get for GLN for non self dual representations in the cohomology of any Shimura variety. They just don't appear there. So, in the cohomology of Shimura varieties, you can only find these self dual guys. Well, now, some, uh, what happens if you. Um, Put it as a boundary component is that somehow you take pi plus pi dual. The Eisenstein series associated to pi and pi dual, and this is self dual somehow. And so this can be somehow written as a periodic limit of cuspidal self dual guys. And then eventually you break it up again into these two pieces. But some of these guy representations that um, I consider here, they, they're not the guy representations that appear in the cohomology of the Siegel moduli space. This guy representation is really coming from somewhere else. It's only through the Hecker eigenvalues that we see the relationship. <sighs> yes, so it was calculated that um, 
if you look at the isotopic part of uh, the cohomology of the Siegel moduli space for this actual Eisenstein series kind of representation, uh, then uh, this will just see a character in the tau cohomology of this Siegel moduli space. So that's not helpful. Okay. More questions? Uh, so then uh, let me try to start explaining the proof of the lifting theorem. So I need to prove. Well, actually, I will probably only say, really say something about this tomorrow. Um, but today I want to explain the geometry uh, that enters into the proof. So let me start with some very stupid remark. Uh, so note that we demand a congruence uh, mod p uh, for this cost form f. So this means that most naturally, uh, this form will probably not be a complex uh, cuspal form, but it will live on some of this periodic space you get by base changing this algebraic variety to QP. So we really want to do something periodic. And so the proof relies on new results on the periodic geometry of the space, of the Siegel moduli space. Okay. And um, so this, this, this is new even Uh, when n is 1, so for the modular curve. And because some of the modular curve everybody feels more familiar with, uh, so I will just explain this in the case of the modular curve. So, Let me first recall something over the complex numbers. Something very stupid. So recall that we had this uh, complex upper half plane. And then we had this Siegel modular space M gamma, uh, which was the quotient of H2 by gamma, where gamma in SL2C was some congruent subgroup. And so uh, this parameterizes elliptic curves plus some level gamma structure. <clears throat> and so we can draw the following diagram. So we can take the inverse limit over all levels gamma of this modular curve M gamma. And now I'm just lying a little bit, but at least if I look at a connected component of this guy, then this will just be the complex upper half space. Because you're taking the quotients by smaller and smaller subgroups, so in the inverse limit you get this. Uh, complex upper half space. And so if you think in terms of, uh, in, ter in moduli theoretic terms, then this parameterizes Paris E and let me now call, not call this alpha again. Let's call this beta, maybe. Um, so where E over C is some elliptic curve, and alpha is a trivialization of the first homology of no, beta. This is a trivialization of the first homology of E. And in fact, if I only want the upper half plane, I need to assume that this is orientation preserving. And so by its very definition, this complex upper half space sits inside the projective line over the complex numbers. Um, what is this map in moduli theoretic terms? So moduli theoretic terms, you take 
such a pair E and beta. And so you're supposed to produce an element in P1. So a quotient of C squared. So what is C squared? C squared, why is this isomorphism beta, can be considered as the first homology with C coefficients. But then there is a Hodge filtration. gives you a surjective map to the Lie algebra of E. It's a Hodge filtration. <coughs> OK. And so what turns out to be the key is a similar picture. Uh, say over CP, um, where CP is some of the periodic analog of the complex numbers. So you take Q bar and make it algebraically closed, but because this is an infinite extension of QP, it's not complete anymore. So you complete again, and then this is an algebraically closed complete extension of Q QP. Yeah, you just take the complex, consider this as a topological space and take the inverse limit as topological spaces. Then there is some difference between SL2Z and the profinite completion of SL2Z. And up to this difference, it's the complex upper half plane. So if you look at a connected component of this guy, then it's really the complex upper half plane. So if you would take this actual inverse limits and you would not get such an isomorphism with Z, but only with Z hat. Um, okay, so we want um, we want a periodic analog of this. And so in particular, um, we need to worry about Hodge filtrations, obviously. So let's talk about Hodge filtrations over CP. <coughs> and maybe this appears to be a minor point, but um, Everything I'm about to say works for any algebraically closed complete extension of QP. So there are even bigger ones than CP. And this is also critical to some of the proofs, but um, it's probably not so important. Uh, uh, now for this overview. Um, so let me take X over CP, some projective and smooth guy. And in fact, in some sense, everything works. Uh, for proper smooth, no, not algebraic varieties, but actually more generally rigid analytic varieties. But again, for the moment, that's not so important. <coughs> uh, so a proper smooth rigid analytic variety, some of the analog of a compact complex manifold. And so Hodge theory, of course, is it doesn't only work for algebraic varieties, but it works for compact Kähler manifolds. And similarly, this uh, Hodge theory over periodic fields, it works for general proper smooth periodic sum of manifolds, oh, not just algebraic ones. And yes, I guess this observation is rather recent. Um, Okay, anyway, so we wanted to talk about Hodge filtrations. And of course, uh, we have this classical theorem of Hodge, um, which says that the Hodge theorem is 
spectral sequence. Uh, which starts from the Hodge cohomology groups and converges to uh, the Ron cohomology. Uh, degenerates at E1. And so in particular, you get a Hodge filtration that for reasons that will become clear in a second, I will call the hodge Durand filtration on the Durand cohomology groups. Where the associated graded quotients are Hodge cohomology. So why is this a theorem of Hodge? So of course Hodge worked with compact Kähler manifolds and proved this degeneration there. But because we are here in the situation of algebraic varieties, uh, we can actually just choose an isomorphism between CP and C. The complex, usually complex numbers, use the results there. So a projective smooth complex variety is uh, Kähler and then transfer this to the periodic world. But actually it turns out that this degeneration also holds for general proper smooth switch dynamic varieties. Um, so, meaning that in some sense they all behave like they are Kähler, although you don't really put a Kähler assumption. Also, but on the other hand, there are some non Kähler complex uh, manifolds which have periodic analogs and for which Hodge symmetry fails, but it are only those ones for which Hodge Durand degeneration still holds. Okay? Anyway. Um, Uh, does this help us? So we get a Hodge filtration, we get a Hodge filtration on the Ram cohomology. And over the complex numbers, we have the isomorphism between singular homology and the Ram homology, which means that with thus we get a filtration on, uh, on this guy. But in the periodic world, that's not true. So um, the Ram cohomology of X is not isomorphic to well, the analog of the singular cohomology is played by tau cohomology now. And so it's not isomorphic to scalar extension to CP. I mean, not canonically, so. There are vector spaces of the same dimension. So of course they're isomorphic, uh, but there's no canonical isomorphism between the two. Um, there are comparison results between RAM and the tau cohomology, but they extend scalars to this big Fontaine field beta RAM, and that's not helpful. So uh, we can't use this Hodge to RAM filtration to get a. So this part gets trivialized in the tau of modular curve. So if you think of X as being in elliptic curves, then this would be trivialized in the tau of modular curves. <coughs> and so a filtration which we have here can't be used to get a filtration here. I'm coming to that. So uh, fortunately there's some uh, a second um, second spectral sequence which looks very similar, but has some interesting differences. So, um, that's what I call the Hodge stage spectral sequence. Um, so this time, it starts at the two page, naturally. So it will also degenerate, so it doesn't make much of a difference where it starts, but, um, So I need to make sure I don't make any typos here. So I and J are exchanged, and there's a Tate twist. 
And so now it converges to a talk over. And so this degenerates at E2, and so you get a hot state filtration. On a talk homology. X is defined over CP, so you may wonder what the tail twist means because there's no Galois group. Um, but so only with the tail twist is natural, and so in particular, if X was defined over some smaller field, and we look at this uh, sequence for X base change to CP, then this sequence becomes Galois equivariant uh, if I put the tail twist here. And so let me explain what happens in the case we're interested in. So let E over CP be an elliptic curve. <clears throat> so then, of course, we're interested in the H1. And so what do the two sequences look like? So on the one hand, we have this hodge around filtration, uh, which looks like follows. So the dual of the Lie algebra of the dual elliptic curve maps to the, let's write the Ram homology as being formally dual to the Ram cohomology. And this subjects onto the Lie algebra of E. And then there is a second sequence. I hope you can read this. Um, okay. Oops. Bit up. So you have the Lie algebra of E, tate twisted by one, and you have the periodic tate module of E tensored up to CP. And then you have this term. And uh, so you see that uh, those two terms are interchanged. Um, so in the complex world, those two things would be canonically isomorphic. Um, and the sequence would be canonically split because of this Hodge decomposition. Um, but in the periodic case, uh, those are not isomorphic. And both of these filtrations are just filtrations. They are not canonically split. They are not canonically split. So if you think about the Hodge-Tate decomposition, which you know over finite extensions of QP, um, then there you know that this periodic Tate module after the tensor with CP actually decomposes canonically as a direct sum of those two terms. So you might expect that the split, but actually um, the decomposition into a direct sum just comes from the Galois action. So uh, if this is defined over uh, a finite extension of QP, then, as I said, the sequence is Galois equivariant, and one can show, as Tate did, that there's a unique Galois equivariant splitting of the sequence. So that's where the splitting comes from. But if it's only defined over CP and there's no Galois action, it's really just a filtration. Okay. I guess I don't have so much time. But, okay, so let me come, now come back to the modular curves and explain uh, what this gives us. So. so say I fix my uh, base level some congruent subgroup gamma and then 
So <coughs> uh, from the sequence, you see that in order to get this uh, filtration here, what you have to trivialize is just the peer dictate module of E. So this means that you only have to go up the p power tower. Um, so we don't have to take the inverse limit over all levels, but only uh, <coughs> the p power levels. So let gamma p to the n be what those elements in gamma are such that gamma is congruent to. So maybe I should write gamma intersected with gamma p to the n for this, but. Let me keep it this way. Um, and so I have my modular curve. It's an algebraic variety of a Q. Uh, but what we're do doing here is really some periodic analytic stuff. So we base change to the field CP. And we don't want to consider this as an algebraic variety, but we really want to consider this as some kind of periodic analytic space. And you might consider it uh, following Tate as a rigid analytic variety. Uh, but I prefer a more recent language, which is Huber's language, language of edX spaces. So it's an edX space. So it's some kind of periodic analytic space. So the advantage, one advantage of edX spaces um, is that you can make sense of edX spaces which are not of finite type. So if you restrict attention to edX spaces of finite type, then they are equivalent to rigid analytic varieties, but you can look at larger spaces. And this will become critical in a, in a second. So, um, that's the theorem. So, the theorem is that it does make sense. So, maybe I should also write P to the N here. It does make sense to take the inverse limit over all levels at N, uh, over all gamma P to the N. And the outcome is what I call a perfectoid space. Let's call this M gamma P infinity uh, over CP. Uh, so it's perfectoid spaces are by definition a full subcategory of edX spaces. They form a full subcategory spaces. Uh, such that. Well, I would like to say it is the inverse limit, but um, this category of edX spaces does not admit inverse limits. Um, so um, I have to use a slightly technical notion of being similar to the inverse limit uh, of these guys. And now at this infinite level, you really get an honest group action of this periodic group GL to QP. So why is this a theorem? So, <coughs> Of course, in periodic analytic geometry, you always want to work with some kind of periodic Banner spaces, and you always want them to be complete. So you have to take a lot of completions always. On the other hand, as you pass up this huge tower, um, your rings are getting bigger and bigger, and they become highly non-Neusserian. Uh, but for non-Neusserian rings, completion is not so well behaved, so it's not flat anymore, and has all kinds of pathological behavior. So it's far from clear that when you try to take this inverse limit that you get anything which is only close to being well behaved. Um, and so it might, so 
for adding spaces in general, you have some kind of definition of a structure sheaf, but unfortunately, it's not always the case that this is really a sheaf. So it's only a pre-sheaf in general. Um, but for these special kinds of infinite type spaces, these so-called perfectoid spaces, the structure pre-sheaf is really a sheaf and they are really well behaved. But that's a non-trivial fact. So. Uh. And the second part of the theorem is that you do get this Hodge-Tate period map. Um, pi Hodge-Tate, um, which goes from this infinite level modular curve and so, just as in the complex case, it goes to the P1. But now again, consider it maybe as an LX space. Um, and so, let me state some properties of this map. Oh, so maybe let, first let me say what it does. So it takes, I mean, it does what you think it does. So it takes an elliptic curve together with a trivialization of the Tate module and maps it to uh, the corresponding Hodge filtration. So again, CP squared is now isomorphic. Why is this map beta uh, to a Tate module with CP? <coughs> and now this has a varying one-dimensional quotient, so this subjects onto Uh, this guy. Note that contrary to the complex case, uh, so there we had the Lie algebra, here's the quotient, here we have this other one. So again, there's some kind of strange twist going on, but anyway, so uh, this map is GL2QP equivariant. So because this P1 here lives over a periodic field, GL2QP naturally acts on it. And it's also equivalent for the heck operators prime to P. Uh, with respect to the trivial action on the flag variety. Now this, this sounds rather, rather strange. So, in particular, this means it's far from injective. So, it means that uh, it contracts whole Hecker orbits for uh, G02 of the delta wave from P. <clears throat> so all these orbits go, are contracted under this map. And it may be very surprising that there is any such map because maybe if you think about uh, these Andre Ort conjectures or so, I mean, you, you expect such a Hecker orbit to be pretty much dense uh, in this variety, but now it turns out that at infinite levels there really is such a map. And probably next time I will explain a bit about its geometry, which is really strange. Well, actually, I need to prove the same theorem for the minimal compactification. And I also needed to prove it for the minimal compactification of Siegel moduli spaces. And that's actually quite involved because some of the boundary of the minimal compactification is not so nice. Um, in that case, it, the theorem becomes easier for compact guys, for compact tumor varieties. Many problems that don't occur there. So the reason most involved part is, part is of the proof is the one dealing with the boundary. For the modular curve, it's not so bad because there is a minimal compactification is still smooth and so on. So it's, yeah. you could do that in there. Uh, so in the rigid analytic world, you only consider the, the so-called classical points, which are defined by finite essential space here. So in 
can simply look just with a simple value of points. But as soon as you go to these uh, non finite type spaces, you have to include uh, points defined over bigger fields. And so, so, in order to understand all the points, you have to understand uh, all this business of a bigger extension. But it also plays a role in the proofs. Um, maybe not on the theorem that's stated so far, uh, but for example, the theorem that will stated next time, um, it's proved by first reducing to a really huge field. So where the variation that to the real numbers is surjective, uh, which is very complete. Uh, and for many reasons, it's important to consider generally. <coughs> So if you consider homology, can you consider homology, you can consider homology and cohomology of these objects, right? Completed uh, perfect turn spaces. Yes. And then you get completed cohomology. Yes. And some about some rather formal argument. Um, the cohomology of this guy is some of the direct limits of homologies of fancy. If you take torsion coefficients. And then if you take ZP coefficients, you get the completion, but after taking the direct limit first at each kind of state. This board, can, could we just take it up a little about the Burrell here, compactification? So yeah. you started with something, a homology class in GLN, yeah. and then you induce it up to make it sit in the, a certain boundary strata for the ambient SP2. Yes. Now, in this, there is some, you've got to worry about the sort of constant representatives, and it is possible something, even if it was of cohomological type on the levy, it might disappear when you. Uh, you know, they, they, you just may not have a constant representative of the right type. Um, and I'm, I'm a little confused. At the level of cohomology, well, okay, the and usually we're working somewhere at infinite level at p, and if you go to, if you make level at p larger and larger, what happens is that um, this correspondence becomes essentially trivial. So the transition maps on this correspondence are multiplication by p. So some of cohomological you don't see them, and the only thing that remains is some of the cohomology in the lowest possible degree. So for the trivial constant. Cost of representative probably. So I think in any case, I only consider the trivial cost of representative. Okay. Or maybe it's dual. So, uh, advantage for going to perfect out spaces in the limit is that you get a Hodge state here. Is that the thing? Or <coughs> no, there, there are also some critical properties of perfect out spaces that I use. Um, I say next time how I use the theorem. Um, the perfecto explains some, some strange properties that I use critically. Um, I'll explain this next time. So, I mean, just knowing that there is some some nice space which you have at, in, at the infinite level wouldn't be enough. You really need to know that it's perfect. And so perfect or roughly means um, so it's some kind of it's some analog of being perfect in characteristic P, which means that the Frobenius is projective. Of course, in characteristic zero, you don't have a Frobenius. Um, but uh, you can still ask in some sense that the Frobenius is surjective mod P. And that's essentially 